three. I'm going to rearrange these things here a little bit. I'm going to squish. I'm going to uh, share Psalm 23 with you, and it won't match exactly to what will be up on your screen because it's kind of the way that I have memorized it and uh, repeated each day in my own devotional times. But it goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I'm going to stop there. For now. Because as I was reading and studying this psalm again today, I noted something. The first half of the psalm, the first three verses, are a testimony. And the last three verses are a prayer. So we're going to deal with the testimony part first, and then we're going to deal with the prayer part. Is that all right? Everybody okay with that? What is a testimony? A testimony is simply sharing your Story. Sharing your story. <coughs> now, we are standing here today on Mother's Day. And there's a lot of things that can be said and should be said about mothers on Mother's Day. And, well, there's, you know, important facts that, that need to be understood and realized. Things <coughs> like, uh, did you know that the busiest day in the year at KFC is Mother's Day? Because that's the day the men are responsible for the cooking. It also is the busiest day of the year at uh, Disneyland. We lived in California for some years, and we got to Disneyland quite often. And we went one time on Mother's Day big. <laughs> Huge lines. But I'm not going to be talking so much particularly about mothers. The last thing I want to do is try to give advice on how to be one, because I've never had any experience. But I do hope that the message today will be an encouragement to you ladies and to the men who are here today. I remember hearing about some kids who wanted to do something really special for mom on Mother's Day. And so they saved up their money and they went to the florist and they wanted, well, they wanted her to have a really restful, peaceful day. So they picked out a lovely wreath that said, Rest in peace. <laughs> and you know, peaceful rest is kind of what these first verses of Psalm 23 are all about. Right? The Lord is my shepherd, I back him. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, or the paths that are right for me, for his name's sake. That's a testimony. That's David telling his story. A week ago, I attended a BIC lead event in Oakville. It was kind of a theological study day. Our speaker was a woman by the name of Sarah He, and her theme was, What's Your Story? She shared a quote that really struck me and stayed with me, and it was this. A hero's story is about the hero. A saint's story is about God. David, the shepherd boy who became a mighty king, was by any standard of measurement a true hero. His most famous victory happened when he defeated the giant Goliath. But that was only one of many great victories that David experienced. Men admired and followed him. 
women loved, uh, loved him and, and sang his praises. But David was not only a hero, he was a saint. A flawed saint, to be sure, but a saint nonetheless. When David <coughs> told his story, where did he place the emphasis? Who was at the center of his story? Who got all the credit and all the glory? Listen again to those first three verses of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths that are right for me, for his name's sake. Do you notice that? David's telling his own story. He's telling his personal experience, but his story is all about his shepherd, about God. Right? Isn't it interesting how we can tell the story, the same story, completely differently? With ourselves at the center or with our Lord at the center? A testimony is your story told with the Lord at the center. When David tells his story, the spotlight is not on David, but on David's Lord. And you may notice if you look in your Bible, that the word Lord is spelled with all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever you see that in your Bible, that is our English, I won't say translation because it's not truly a translation, but that is the way that they use to designate God's name, Yahweh. And they'll translate it as Lord in all capital letters. What is God's name? He tells us in Scripture. His name is Yahweh, or some people say Jehovah. We're not exactly sure how to pronounce Hebrew because we're not very uh, literate in that language. And if anybody here knows how to speak Hebrew, well, you can be the exception. But uh, sometimes we hear people speak kind of <coughs> casually and, and freely when something happens and it doesn't need to be a very big event, and they'll say, Oh my God! And when they do that, are they taking God's name in vain? Actually, no. Not technically. God's name isn't God. God's name is Yahweh. That's what he's revealed. Now, should we say that? It's probably not the greatest thing to say. The Bible does tell us that we'll have to give account for every idle word that we speak. But we do want to recognize that God's name is holy. Now, going back to David, I think that all of us would agree that David lived a full life, and he lived life to the full. His heart was filled with courage, filled with hope, filled with joy most of the time. How extraordinary. I mean, he lived in dangerous times. At the time of David, there were no things like government health care or Blue Cross. There were no pension plans. There was the constant danger of invasion by foreign enemies. He lived in a time when all too many women died in childbirth. They didn't have cures or treatments for many of the diseases that we can now see modern medicine address in our time. And yet, Although he lived in dangerous times, David knew that his future was his friend. Why? Because he knew that the Lord, Yahweh, was his shepherd. Do you know what sucks the vitality out of life? The sense that you have done something wrong, and you're not ready to die tonight and meet God with confidence. If you're in that situation, life doesn't feel good at all. How can you acquire the assurance that your life is under the care and the protection of a God who loves you and wants the best for you? Let me illustrate with a true story. There was a man named Bartimaeus. He was blind. There was no such thing as government support. He was forced to sit by the roadside and beg. No doubt his clothes were dirty. No 
doubt, he was a pretty sorry looking piece of humanity, as people saw it. His hands were probably gnarled. His hair may well have been unkempt. But one day as he sat there with his tin cap cup and, and perhaps uh, a few small coins within it, he heard a crowd approaching. And somebody said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Jesus of Nazareth is coming this way. And Bartimaeus recognized that name. He had heard of Jesus. He had heard that he was a miracle worker. He had heard, in fact, that he was the Messiah, the son of David who was to come. And so that poor man sitting there begging began to cry out. He heard that name and he cried out to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Jesus stops and heals him. His life is transformed with sight. He can now work. He can now see to travel unassisted. He's completely changed by the power of the love of Jesus. You may pray a similar prayer. I often pray what is known as the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus heals the brokenhearted and forgives the sin of those who call on him in faith and repentance. He refreshes and restores my soul. There are seasons in our spiritual lives. <coughs> For people who are just beginning the Christian life, it's often a springtime experience. It's an amazing thing to be born again. But time goes by and you realize that it's not always sunshine and daisies. As you mature in discipleship, you experience personal growth through exposure to the summer sun and the wind and the rain. And then the autumn comes. In the harvest season, you offer to God a life of fruitful service. But strangely, it is often after a time of fruitful service and victory that the winter comes. Remember Elijah, the great prophet? After his victory over the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth on Mount Carmel, he goes into deep depression, runs for his life, when the queen, wicked queen Jezebel, threatens him. Sometimes you feel like your prayers aren't getting through. Music and worship no longer lift your heart. Why do these times happen? I don't have the answer to why any of these things might happen. But I do know that sometimes, and often probably, it is a case of simple neglect. You start skipping church. You forget your times of daily devotion. You get too busy to read the Bible and pray. And you think it won't make a lot of difference. I heard something said by the famous piano player, Liberace. He, uh, he said that he had to practice playing the piano every single day. And somebody said, why do you have to play every day when you're already a master of the instrument? And he said, if I was to go a month without practicing, he said, my fans would begin to notice the difference. If I went a week without practicing, the music critics would hear he said, and if I went one day without practicing, I would know the difference. If practicing the piano was that important to a master, how important are our times of Bible reading and prayer? 
I encourage you to make it a daily habit to spend quiet time with God. And when the church people get together, be there. Be counted. If you think you don't need it, the next person needs you to lift them up. We have had, I'll tell you what, we have had some really terrific programs in this church recently outside of our Sunday morning. Man, who were there yesterday, we had a chance to hear from Tom Tripp. He was also with us a couple of nights earlier here, speaking to the group. I know you can't come every time the doors are open. I, I understand that. I don't expect you to be here all the time. But I want to encourage you to take advantage of all the good things that you can here at DCC. You'll find that it will build your spirit and help you to deal with those winter seasons of life. In many cases, by avoiding them altogether. Do not give up when those tough times come. Do not lose heart. You can be assured that God will give you divine guidance. And so, we want to go on now to the prayer part of Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, So you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and loving mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. Notice the shift there? The first half of the psalm to the people about God. The second half of the psalm, to God. Directly. Prayer is just talking to God and listening to His voice. I just love that verse. Even though I walk through the valley of death, or through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You know, the Bible never denies the reality of evil in our world. I tell you, in your lifetime, you will experience evil, trouble, loss, and pain. And when you are faced by the most dangerous of circumstances, I want to let you know, you do not need to be afraid. Why? Because the Lord is with you. Tom Tripp said yesterday at men's breakfast, one person plus God is a majority. Even when you walk through the darkest valley, the valley of the shadow of death, he will be there to comfort you. Now this is not morbid to talk about death. The fact is, you can live and die with confidence. In fact, you're not really ready to live until you are ready to die. This week, I will turn 65. I will officially be a senior. Somebody graciously reminded me that I am now as close to 90 as I am to 40. <laughs> but even if you are 90, or even if you are 100, your future is your friend. Verse 5 says, You, Lord, prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Now make no mistake about it. The Christian is surrounded by enemies. Jesus said, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. The enemy is all around us. In fact, we are surrounded by the enemy. The enemy may, be, enemy may be unbelief, doubt, jealousy, resentment, pride, self-pity, lust, you name it. The enemy is sin in any form. How can we defeat the enemy? Does Holy Communion help? The key word here is remember. Remember. The words right there engraved on the communion table in remembrance of me. In 
Those words appear on communion tables all over the world. <coughs> we eat the broken bread and we drink the wine of communion. We remember that God was willing to stop at nothing to save us. The cross is an inspiring symbol that God is for us. See, sweet words alone do not redeem women and men. Jesus gave the greatest messages that were ever given in the history of the world. The Sermon on the Mount. Fantastic teaching. <coughs> that was not enough. Sweet words may impress people, but only sacrifice redeems people and makes them disciples. Holy Communion reminds us that Jesus died for us, sacrificed His body and His blood for us. Holy Communion reminds us, too, that we are redeemed children of God. Holy Communion reminds us that God is on our side, and we will win the battle because He will win the battle. In fact, He's already won the battle. Holy Communion reminds us that Jesus rose victorious over death and sin, and that he ascended to the Father, and that he is coming back again. When the Christian drinks deeply of the cup of communion, he or she remembers that in Christ we are more than conquerors, and our future is our friends. And then we can affirm with the psalmist David, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Father God, thank you for the 23rd Psalm. Thank you for the testimony and the prayer of David and what it teaches us today. How it encourages us in whatever situation of life we may find ourselves. And now, God, as we come to the table of communion, we do so in remembrance of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your body broken for us, for your blood shed for us. As we eat and drink together, may we experience a real and personal connection with our world. Call on the gentlemen who are assisting with communion this morning. <coughs>